Um, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have all of you on board for this really wonderful dynamic national conversation around creative youth development. My name is Ashley Hare and I support the work of the Creative Youth Development National Partnership as the national coordinator. And so what we have done in the last couple of years together is create these action team groups out of the Creative Youth Development Blueprint. And one of those action team groups you'll find um, in the Blueprint is the field building team. And so we have James Miles who will be moderating today's wonderful um, conversation today um, with our speakers who was part of that field building team in growing a um, in growing a conversation around Creative Youth Development for through webinars and other offerings that we can offer the field together. Um, first, I want to give some context on a little bit more of the learning series and outline our time together today, and then I'll hand it off to our moderator, James Miles, today. Um, for those of you who may be brand new, and um, which is exciting, hello, welcome, um, to Creative Youth Development, um, CYD, as we sometimes say in short term, is a growing national network of youth and adult practitioners and funders and administrators and also cross-sector partners dedicated to integrating artistic practice with the values of youth-driven leadership, racial equity and social justice, and collective action in our communities. This learning series is designed to amplify, amplify those values of creative youth development and spark discussion together. Um, we're grateful for our partners who are supporting this space for us to learn and build relationship together. And today's webinar is hosted by the National Guild for Community Arts Education, which is one of the CYD national partner organizations. And this webinar is made possible by the generous support of the National Endowment for the Arts. If you'd like to see any other recordings on previous webinars this year, the past year, or ones before, we encourage you to go to creativeyouthdevelopment.org and take a look underneath our blog post and our online learnings for some really robust conversations we've had in the past. The webinar is scheduled to last about 60 minutes uh, due to the large volume of all of your um, lovely beings being on this call together. Your lines have been muted and so we'll mute mine shortly so that way we can uh, fully have our attention on these wonderful speakers. If you have a question, we encourage you to share your ideas or maybe even resources that you have that you want to share. We encourage you to simply um, check on your chat box if you're new to Zoom. Um, if you hover to the bottom, there's three dots for more that will open a chat box for you and you can ask questions as they come to you or give resources, etc. The other thing that we encourage you to do is at the top of Zoom, um, you'll see something that says speaker view, so you can start to change the way that you're viewing um, your Zoom today. And so because our, all of our lovely speakers are on one um, screen today, I would encourage you to put speaker view so that way you can see them um, big, bold, and beautiful in their time. We also may be screen sharing some things with you too, so that might be helpful. Um, without further ado, I think I said all the logistical things and I'm going to hand it off to James and become a participant and listen to the wonderful conversation. James? Greetings and salutations, nation. How are you? Uh, this is a wonderful conversation we're going to have around social justice and the arts. Uh, I'm James Miles. I'll be moderator today. I use he, him pronouns. We will introduce everyone else. Actually, they will introduce themselves, uh, starting with my great friend to my right, <laughs> Tina. Hey everybody, my name is Tina Lampadula. I'm a theater teaching artist. Um, I'm originally one of the founders of Arts Corps and I work uh, today um, as the Arts Education Project Manager for the City of Seattle. So we are here today at the lovely arts offices for the City of Seattle. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Dunn and I am a school teacher in Seattle Public Schools. Worked um, several different, di different buildings in the district and I also uh, write curriculum for ethnic studies for Seattle Public Schools, and I work for the Center for Racial Equity as a racial equity literacy coach. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Atkins. I'm a theater teaching artist based here in Seattle, and Jennifer and I were partnered together on the program that we're about to talk about today. Great, uh, let's, let's get busy before we start. Actually, now that we've started, let's ask the first question. How did you get into this work? <laughs> Um, well, I think we're specifically talking about theater of the press today, yeah. and so I was introduced to um, the moves, the theater of the press moves, 
through um, partnership with Tina Creative Advantage, who partnered with Tracy Castro Gill, mm -hmm. that's correct, and um, came to Ethnic Studies work group and pitched some of the ideas, the idea of working in partnership with a teaching artist, um, said, yes, let's do it. It's a little bit, you know, an experiment. We're going to make it work. We're going to figure it out together. So that's how I got involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have my master's in educational theater and as part of my master's degree, which was now a long time ago, but as part of my, <laughs> as part of my master's degree, I studied theater of the oppressed with um, Chris Vine and Helen White, who are two incredible practitioners um, in New York. They were at NYU, which was where I got my degree there now at, at City University of New York instead. But so that's, that's my foundation with theater of the oppressed. Uh, and then it's something that I've used, you know, sometimes more, sometimes less over the, you know, my years as a teaching artist. So then when Tina and Gail at Seattle Public Schools asked me if I wanted to be involved in this project, it was a great opportunity to sort of go, go more deeply back into work that I have used for a long time, but in much more sort of piecemeal ways. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add that what we're going to talk about today is really some amazing co-teaching that came out of a special project in support of ethnic studies through the Laird Norton Family Foundation. So I help run a program called the Creative Advantage here in Seattle, which is an arts education equity initiative started by Lara, who's on the call. Lara, if you want to pipe in later, please, please do. Um, and it's really to make sure that there's um, arts education available equitably to all young people in Seattle public schools. Out of that, the Laird Norton Family Foundation gave some extra money um, or offered extra money for us to apply to do teacher professional development. And they really came to us and said, what would you like that to be? And we felt really strongly we wanted to support ethnic studies, which is a new critical and burgeoning um, field um, that has been really trying to get off the ground and is getting off the ground in, Se in our district in Seattle. Um, and we were considering like ways to support that through arts interventions and as all theater people, this felt like the, the most um, resonant thing we could do. Now you mentioned theater of the oppressed. For those that do not know or aren't familiar, what is theater of the oppressed? Mm, that's an excellent question. I'm, <laughs> glad you asked. I'm so glad I asked that question too. <laughs> um, so theater of the oppressed is a community-based education tool that uses theater as a form of transformation. And it was created by uh, a Brazilian man named Augusto Boal, years and years ago now, mm -hmm. like 30, 40 years ago, I should probably know that number. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so Ball, uh, Augusto Ball worked with uh, peasant and worker populations and he developed this system basically. And it's now, it's something that's used all over the world for social and political activism, for conflict resolution, for community building, um, even for therapy and government legislation. And there are lots of different forms of theater of the oppressed. Um, it's called theater of the oppressed in part because it is based on Paolo Freire's pedagogy of the uh, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed. So it comes from those, those ideas around starting from where your participants are, about engaging critical thinking skills. Um, it's about analyzing rather than accepting. It's about questioning rather than giving answers. Um, it, it uses the idea that theater is not about performer is out here or performers are up there and we are here sitting back as the audience. But um, he uses a the phrase spect actors. So the idea that there are no spectators, excuse me, that everybody is involved in the art, um, that everybody is involved in all aspects of the art, and that we can use the art to, to explore, the, explore what we think, to, to act on our ideas rather than just talk about our ideas. Can I, can I add on Please to that? Do. So yes. with, and then the idea of action being the, the, what we need right. to get to is yeah. not just talking about the problem, but actually doing something. Yeah. So just to connect back to the Paolo Ferry connection um, with the pedagogy of the oppressed, and if you're not familiar with that work, then I strongly recommend if you're interested in theater of the oppressed that you read Paolo Ferry's work first, because it really sets up this foundation for problem posing education versus banking education. And that is, I think, one of the biggest problems in education today is that we're still trying to bank education and have these, this curriculum that's like, we're going to learn this and then we're going to test it and we're going to learn more and we're going to build um, versus like looking around from where we're at, like we said, and saying, what's, what's a problem? Who's having a problem? Mm -hmm. Right? And, and kind of unpacking from there. And that that's where, where the work starts from, not from some 
end result to working backward, but like what's actually mm -hmm. happening right now. Right. Yeah, and those ideas of empowerment, empowering mm -hmm. learners. Yeah. yeah, and that we have the solutions. Right. right, and we can imagine a different outcome. Mm -hmm. Right, we can stop right. and yeah. rethink it. Yeah, and, and then we try do something out. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Very powerful. Yeah, and I know the work started working in the communities uh, for right. a while. Yeah. This is really focused on, on in the classroom. Why do you think it works in the classroom? Mm. I, I think a lot of students are just ready for something else. Yeah. Um, they're 21st century learners. Um, I have to make a point all the time of like, I, my students were born in the internet. They were born with phones in their hands and a connectivity that I, I still don't really understand <laughs> um, the world that they live in. And they, 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 they want something else to do besides write this paper that's like a conversation between me and you and they want to to feel like they can do something in a very challenging world um you know things are just getting more and more complicated with um you know climate you know climate change climate action it's a lot to the process mm -hmm. yeah i mean they're they're already engaged in the problems like they're engaged they're in the problems them. because they live them mm -hmm. and i think in a different way than you know some of us who are a little bit older did when we when we were that age and so if they're already engaged with the problems like why would we pretend that the problems don't exist like why not give them the tools now why, why wait until they become adults like what does that mean to right yeah. and, and while it's rooted in the local because we have the ability to, to use yeah. the internet to go global it's just it's such a powerful way to learn solutions from what have other people done in similar situations? And how can we share our solutions with other people too? So it's kind of creating this conversation among young people. It's really, really fascinating. Can, this, thank you. Can you talk about uh, the relationship between teaching artists and classroom teacher and working on units around ethnic studies before we actually get into sure. ethnic can, studies? Can you actually show the slide then yes. so I can talk about how all this work got developed a little bit? Can we back up and just look at the framework for ethnic studies for a second? Please. Okay. Okay, so I just want to take a moment to kind of um, speak to ethnic studies as it's developing in Seattle. Um, it, you know, ethnic studies has a long history of people who have been you know, oppressed and trying to address that oppression. Um, but ethnic studies, as it's being um, developed in Seattle, is modeled after the Oakland Unified School District's framework. Um, there's four pieces to it, and if we can go to that slide, I'd love to just show you. That was Augusta Blau. Yeah, 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 I didn't recognize that person. Um, these slides are from a workshop that Rachel and I did at the Seattle Art Museum over the summer, um, sharing our work too. So if you can keep going to there. there. So um, I'm part of this um, writing, this ethnic studies writing group, and we are teachers in Seattle Public Schools, and we wrote a bunch of curriculum um, last spring. And so I collaborated with Savannah Jameson, who uh, is teaching at Interagency, and at the time I was teaching at Nathan Hill High School. And um, I developed, we developed a unit called A Revolution of Values, Finding Your Fire. Um, that work, the unit, actually got picked up by teachers at a different school who rolled out our work. And Rachel and I picked up on um, the work that was developed by Heather Griffin at Chief Cell High School. So we did the unit called Our River, Our City. Um, and that's, so we've kind of like written units and then teachers and teaching artists kind of decided what sounded good. And then um, Rachel wrote some, rewrote some of the curriculum in embedding the um, theater of the oppressed right. elements to it to really take the thing that, <laughs> um, you know, I, I fancy myself a kind of innovative um, educator. And yet I saw so many places where it's still very paper-based and still very like, okay, we're just gonna write about this versus the like beauty. I hope maybe we can model a few things in a minute. <laughs> we didn't rehearse. Yeah. I just wanted to see how like, it's, it's, it's a little intimidating if you're just getting into this, but it's actually really, um, energizing it's inspiring and because it's collaborative it's just really engaging so yeah. should we go through more slides sure sure yeah. actually because yeah. um if you, if you keep going 
Uh, one more. Yeah. Okay, so back to ethnic studies. So these are the frameworks that I was talking about that we are um, adapting from Oakland. And so um, it starts with discussions about identity and then weaving in power and oppression, resistance and liberation, and then reflection and action. And like the the pieces, the Boal pieces, the theater of the oppressed pieces work so perfectly with this framework. Like somebody else already <laughs> planned all that and just so um, they work great and especially some of the warm-ups that get at identity pieces and identity is very difficult um, for for many people and especially young people who might not feel really comfortable in their identity especially if they're from a marginalized group it makes spaces for people to say things that are not necessarily like, please answer this question right now, but in a, in a sharing space, you can, you can reveal something about yourself without it being so much because we're all sharing some pieces. So that's, that's just something I wanted to take the time to mention right now is that these frameworks are working out in ways too, like with power and oppression, um, that it can work in a variety of spaces because there will be a variety of people Mm -hmm. in, in any of those spaces and can kind of unpack like are you feeling oppressed and like are you an oppressor in any way um, and we kind of got at that with the idea of the, the game bombs and shields right. which yeah. we could talk through yeah. but, um, and again the idea of like looking then at um, where in the world or where have people been successfully resisting and, liber and, and achieving liberation and what can we learn from those things and how can we move our community into action <laughs> Do you want to talk more about this? Yeah, ethnic sure, studies? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 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 No, right. no, right. Jennifer, we love hearing your voice. <laughs> um, so just what is ethnic studies? Again, there's a little bit of um, non-clarity, I guess, of what ethnic studies is. I think it can trigger some people of like, what are we, like anti-weight curriculum or things like that. But it's, I mean, you saw the frameworks, everyone who's um, you know, watching here and what we're, what it is, is it's about really um, decolonizing the curriculum and I guess well, we're the, the sure, perfect sure, yes. today right. um, to, to, to look at indigeneity because everyone is from somewhere. They really are, right? And it's not, um, it's, it's a look back into your, your own personal history, which gets kind of back at that identity. It is anti-racist. Um, we live in a racist society, and I don't know if anyone wants to debate that or why you're, <laughs> why you're on this call if you don't accept that. Um, but I, I think there are really great resources out right now for um, everyone, like Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, mm -hmm. um, and then his work before that, Stamped from the Beginning, to really kind of look again at the stories that we've been told and um, making space for counter-narratives. For, um, for marginalized voices, for histories that haven't been told, and, and surfacing those. And in that is um, this real, yeah, I guess there's, there is a disruption to the master narrative, to say this is the way it went and this is how it is, and to say, let's look again, right? and to involve more voices. Right, whose voices are missing. Yeah. yeah. And so what I was going to say just really quickly, one last thing, yeah, yeah. this particular point yeah. is about, um, I just want to be very clear that ethnic studies is not multicultural education. It's not like, okay, we read some literature from African authors and we've read some, you know, Latinx authors, we're good. It's like, it's not about that. It's about really interrogating the power structures and really finding our own place in them and thinking about what we can do with our privileges. So how does uh, theater of the oppressed fit into ethnic studies? Well, like I said, it's, it's the moves. Um, some yeah. of the games really do, a, like it's gamifying as part mm -hmm. of the ethnic studies um, curriculum. It's how do you make it like role play? How do you make it, but it's not role play. Theater of the oppressed is not role play. So I want to be clear about that. Um, and then I almost think we probably have to demonstrate some things in a minute. <laughs> I hope so. Um, but I don't know if you want to just kind of speak from how things look from your end. Of yeah, I mean, I, I can, but I also wonder, Tina, if you might want to say a couple of words about how, because this, this came from somewhere, right? It wasn't like, mm -hmm. just what, where the impetus came on your ends for you seeing these programs and deciding this, this was a fit that you wanted to create, and then we can talk about it more on kind of the ground mm -hmm. level. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, uh, as a theater teaching artist, um, 
as somebody whose role is um, within the kind of um, collective impact model we have at Seattle Public Schools is to sort of nudge toward, um, you know, more radical thinking around how to change systems. And we saw allies in the teacher activists who were really trying to begin and find a foothold for ethnic studies. And as theater people, or as a theater person myself, and Gail Selhorst, who leads uh, visual performing art for Seattle Public Schools as a theater person who we've worked with as well, um, we know the power of that. Um, I think that it's been a really cool process to think about bringing in theater teaching artists, talking about like ways, you know, we utilize aspects of theater the oppressed, ways we wanted to like um, morph it um, to fit how we're working in this scenario and truly collaborate with teachers to bring alive different units. Um, yeah, I think it just felt like the timing was really right, that there was a core of folks like, William. Um, yeah, <laughs> like Jennifer who were already so invested in the work and, um, and yeah, that we could ally our, our actual resources, time and um, expertise to furthering those goals, which are really critical goals. We had a lot of conversation around, can we do theater of the oppressed in oppressive systems, mm -hmm. right? So part of the shape <laughs> of this was like, even if, you, you know, even if you were bringing uh, really talented people who have done a lot of personal work, and also really care about sort of the kind of community they're building in a classroom, that they're trying to hold brave space for young people to talk about, you know, their personal identities and the oppressions that they face. Mm -hmm. um, could you, can you really give them the reins and say, what do we do? Um, and let go enough to let them really make change. Um, and I think, you know, we have a one year of this, um, pilot under our belt. We just got a second year of funding to continue. Um, and it's looking like a third is really possible, which is amazing. Um, and that just deepens, mm -hmm. you know, and the conversations um, deepen and the complexities deepen, which is wonderful because that's, that's what I see my role to be, yeah. right? As an outside nudge toward our district, as our, you know, toward the district. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, so, I was just going to say, I want to see it in action. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. just to add on to yeah. something I thought of while you were speaking, Tina, yeah. is um, one way that it's a perfect fit with um, in, in education, too, is like a lot of the goals, at least in um, my part of the world, are to get the sage off the stage and have less didactic mm -hmm. instruction. Mm -hmm. This absolutely does that because mm -hmm. it's not about me and I'm not the one with the, the solutions and I'm not the one experiencing. Mm -hmm all of the oppressions, right? So it, it really does do that thing where it decentralizes the, the authority, right? In the room at least. And like, we have not overcome the oppressive system altogether, um, but it, it does create um, maybe thinking patterns about solutions and like, you know, there's just, there's mm -hmm. things that can, little seeds yeah. to help, help lead down that road. Yeah. Well, it's a process and I mean, so theater, theater of the oppressed is a process, like unlike other kinds of art forms or even other kinds of theater where it's, it's about a product, right? Like theater mm -hmm. of the oppressed is all about, is experiential. So that's a way that it connects. Mm -hmm. um, theater of the oppressed is about, um, it's, it's about finding a different way in and even coming back to identity. It's about like, there's a whole series of activities that are about uh, seeing what you see, and what you hear like that are about even just your senses like what is your personal experience in the world and then expressing that mm -hmm. um you know i think back about our first day in your in your class and, and putting up like, i think we had, had something up on a slide that was about like that that was about the idea of breaking the machine that like mm -hmm. you have that um and there's there's a ball quote that i'm going to get wrong right now but it's but it's something along the, the lines of just totally, I, I just totally lost it, lost it, but you know, you know what I'm talking about, where it's like, I, that theater of the oppressed is about looking at the mechanization mm -hmm. of the world that mm -hmm. we live in and the way that we mechanize ourselves mm -hmm. and then breaking it. Mm -hmm. And you have to know what the machine is to break the machine, right? But you, but you can break the machine and the best way to break the machine is from inside the machine. Mm -hmm. And that that's what 
Like that's yeah. what it felt like we yeah. did in your yeah. classroom. Yeah. And it feels, I mean, this goes back to maybe an earlier question before or mm -hmm. a question that's coming about like, how do you do it within the system? Mm -hmm. um, and in, I mean, it's hard no matter what, right? But it's easier from inside the system because you're already in mm -hmm. and, and you know what the system is, you know what the machine is and you have to know what it is in order to break it. Mm -hmm. um, it also, I feel like I'm a little bit trying to answer this question of like why theater of the oppressed and ethnic studies. And to me, it's also related to that idea of use the form to teach the form, mm -hmm. right? And that theater of the oppressed is a form of ethnic studies mm -hmm. in that it's about counter narrative. Mm -hmm. It's about what's the point of view here that's different from the point mm -hmm. of view that somebody just gave to you and said, this is what you should think about that thing. Mm -hmm. Theater of the oppressed is an opportunity for individuals to discover what they think, and then for a group to dis discover mm -hmm. together what they think and what their different ideas and responses, like how they interact and intersect with one another's. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to all, all of the different games. I mean, there's, you know, in theater of the oppressed, there are different forms and different styles it's not just one thing but there is a big aspect of it that are games and mm -hmm. activities like he's got a whole book called games for actors and non-actors mm -hmm. and um you know so that can be used that that are not a curriculum necessarily mm -hmm. or that are things that can be used sort of in pieces and inserted and that get to so much of what jennifer was just talking about a couple minutes ago in terms of yeah, just like having a different relationship to each other and to what we're learning mm -hmm. and to the world we live in. Right. We had lots of pairs of teaching artists and teachers collaborating in this project. Um, but you two really vibed together. We did. Um, <laughs> we do. Super love. Um, in a really special way. So why do you think that was? Um, well, Rachel's been like pretty open to like my like, let's just try this. And uh, maybe like yeah. Rachel's also like, let's just try this. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Um, so I think you do you do have to learn again. If I'm sort of talking to educators at the minute a little bit, if, if anyone's on here, um, that to like let go, and like it's gonna be okay somehow, <laughs> even if there's a discussion yeah. about why it didn't go well. Okay, yeah. there's still some learning to happen. So it it looks very different than um, what like we're taught. What we're like really drilled into what a classroom should look like and what what an administrator would want to see like coming in i mean there's there's some some things that are and and because again we're doing it in an oppressive system there's definitely pushback for it too um but i don't know it's just like i'm open I, mean, it, it, I, I feel like it was it was two opposite <laughs> things at once it was that you let go it's not all on you but right. that like for you it's like i for me as a, as a teaching artist, like my work is I go into somebody else's room and like try to respect their space and try to respect their norms and their expectations and everything, but I've got to screw it up. I've got mm -hmm. to mess with it because yeah. that's my job. Um, and you, I, so I came in and on the one hand you let go and on the other hand you jumped that's, in with both true. feet. And a lot true. of classroom <laughs> teachers don't feel comfortable doing that. Like I would come in in the morning and be like, oh, I, I had this brilliant <laughs> idea from, from yesterday and we're going to do this instead. Or I'd come in and you'd be like, okay, I just, I just want to try it. Like, let me just try. And so many classroom teachers are like, oh, teaching artists in my room? Okay, like, I'm going to pull back. Right. Or worse, like, I'm going to sit over here yeah. on my computer and check my email. Yeah, and, yeah you're that. fine. Like, you got that. And it was the opposite of that. Um, and so that felt really exciting, especially because you wrote the ethnic studies curriculum. I mean, you didn't write the curriculum that we were working with, but like you are so embedded in that work. Yeah. Um, and I was coming at it, you know, in this one sort of avenue of, okay, let me look at this work that other people have done and just figure out where to put theater of the oppressed in it. But you had all of that background mm -hmm. knowledge that, that I could sort of cushion into. Um, well, there, there's yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Just, I yeah. Collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. mindful collaboration. Um, and, and I will say, like, I was incredibly nervous about doing the theater things myself because I was really worried I wouldn't have the energy. I love watching theater, and I've been in a few minor roles, but it's not my it's not my location. Like, I'm a visual arts person. That's like my wheelhouse, but. I, I was surprised at how quickly I jumped in. And it's like, that's kind of the magic of the work though, too, is like, because once you're in it, you're part of it. Yeah. And you, you are, you are responsible. Like, I'm in it. Like, so yeah, I did get like my creative juices were flowing once we got going. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So, you know, you, you said something about pushback. Is that from students, administration, 
principals, we, everyone. Yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, for students, uh, there, there are plenty of students who absolutely love this because they don't like the, the way you're still doing 19th century, you know, 19th century school. Um, but there are some resistors who are like, this is, how am I going to get an AP credit out of this, right? How is yeah. this going to improve my GPA? Like there's so, so, some students have, are so like conditioned in that way. Um, and I, I, it's not, I don't think it's their fault, right? So that's where I go back to blaming us mm -hmm. um, as the, the oppressors, like I'm naming myself in that um, as perpetuating that system of like, take more AP classes, get your transcript ready for college and do all these things that are not necessarily actually authentic, um, driven from your own desire to, um, to I, I mean, I don't know what everyone's motivations are, but you know, mine are to do something meaningful, um, to be a helpful, productive person, and, and not just to assimilate students, which is sort of like what I, when I started getting involved really in this work and really grabbing onto the tools is when I understood that I was an assimilator, that my mm -hmm. role, even though as a woman of color and trying to like work in schools with, you know, um, disadvantaged youth and like we can do this like I was still kind of just systematizing them into the superstructure that we'd already created and I was like oh yeah like how do I how do I change this well it only like to, it has to be that like stop right now what we're doing and start analyzing all of it um, so then students some students kind of pull in about like that because they're like, yeah, I don't like this feeling of like, I'm on this conveyor belt of I gotta get all these things done and then just replace school with a job, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, the, or or prison. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, I don't know, there's still so many, I can't speak, I'm not an administrator, I can't speak mm -hmm. to what all the motivations for administrators to push back, um, but it doesn't look like, like school, and it turns out that the, when you get local and you start naming problems, administration gets named right mm -hmm. so the, the powers they get powers when people speak truth to power power pushes back right they're not like oh okay well let me just fix that mm -hmm. i see the error of right. my oppressive ways yeah. um so yeah do you think that's like the first step towards decolonizing education is theater of the oppressed letting go uh going with the flow resisting where you can. I certainly wonder how this would go in a room full of administrators now. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> Let us come and be yes. professional. We, we are available. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the story of what happened during our time together that like feels to me like the biz biggest example of like the pushback out of the room was the, the graffiti and the um, so, in Je so in Jennifer's classroom, literally like right outside of the classroom where she was teaching at Nathan Hale, there was a little like glass box in the hallway that's like a study room. Mm -hmm. um, and we came to school one day and somebody, you should add on because I'm probably going to tell it wrong, but somebody had graffitied on the table that's in this room, like this room that's open to any yeah. student to go and sit and work, right? Had graffitied KKK mm -hmm. and some other stuff. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Someone, you should tell this part because I don't want to tell it wrong, but tell, tell what the administration did and okay. then we can talk about so, what the students did in so, response. Um, the, the graffiti was cleaned up and a sign went on the door that was like um, offensive or inappropriate. Inappropriate. Inappropriate, inappropriate writing. Yes. You know, and I, we were like, what? <laughs> no, that's not just inappropriate, inappropriate. that's yeah. racist. Yeah. So students started making their own signs. Well, because you had to explain it to your students, right? Your students came in and they were like, why is that room closed? What is the sign about inappropriate language? And you told them what it was and they were like, oh, hell no. Yeah, yeah. So they first made their own sign that said, like, this is racist. Um, then they put, they put on an open forum to talk about racism in yeah. the school. Which they planned in our class. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I mean, this is, I, I think you think this is true. I think you've said this, but like, <laughs> if we had not been as far along as we were at that point in ethnic studies and in theater of the oppressed, mm -hmm. it's not clear whether those students would have felt like, oh, this is, this is a thing that we can actually mm -hmm. do something about and we don't have to just sit back and take mm -hmm. it or we don't have mm -hmm. to just like change the sign mm -hmm. and be sort of subversive in that way. But like, they took over the school because mm -hmm. they were mad. That was great. Yeah, is it, and that's that's isn't that what Augusta Wild Point 
Like that was his objective. Yeah. You know, I remember reading about how when he first started doing uh, Theater of the Oppressed, the people in the audience would be so hyped, they'd want to do something. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't know how to deal with it. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the term spectator. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if yeah. adults are going to not even properly name an act of racism, yes. then I'm going to empower students to give, to be able to, to, to do something, right? right? To, to take that ownership. To take that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, we know this happened in Ethan Hale and that thinks I class. Can this happen in K through eight? Well, we're going to find that out this we year. We are going to find that out this year. So what? this year we're actually, nice segue, did you? Oh, oh, that that nice setup. Setup. <laughs> I'm just responding to the people in the audience. Uh, oh, okay. awesome. Yeah, so this year we're actually going to ex- um, continue some of the work in high schools because um, we were in three high schools last year, and then we're going to expand to middle school and elementary school mm. as so a pilot. First, first grade classrooms. First grade classrooms. Yeah. So I guess that answers the question, how early is too early to talk about racism? It's never, never. too early. Oh, never. never too early. And I yeah. think what we're finding, yeah. and, and we're having a lot of interesting conversations about sort of uh, teaching artists, practitioners, and teachers, you know, who have good strategies and are used to working with younger grades, to talk about there's like a fundamental difference between race and racism. And often mm-hmm. when younger kids start to talk about these things, they think that just having a conversation about race is like, they can complete the two, yes. right? So a lot of it is about, you know, mm-hmm. empowering them to speak about who they are and name the identities they want to name and, mm-hmm. and yes and all of their offerings, right. wherever they're at, um, and ask them, Teach them how to ask more questions and ask them more questions, right? And stop saying, I'm on my African-American berry, or I'm using the African-American board or the Caucasian board. What? what? That's a joke, by the way. Okay. That's not real. Okay. Okay. I was like, I'm, 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 I'm making that. I'm making that. I'm making that. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, wow, we got to do some more people we got to work with. <laughs> okay. So I'm wondering how this fits in into our current political environment. Uh, you know, you, you've done this, you did this rather recently while Trump was still, in, still is currently still mm-hmm. in office. Uh, has that impacted either administrative pushback or pull in or students either way? Um, well, I don't know if I can speak cause, because we are working so locally. I mean, there's, it's there, yes. um, but it's almost like, let's, leave that out of that out for a second and just who are we like who are we in this room what are we about and what do we want to create like Mm -hmm. so um we we didn't zoom out too much in in that space because we wanted them to basically what we did after we identified um, a machine in seattle the machine of gentrification is what we worked with so it was a way to um, learn about gentrification without just reading about it. Like we built a machine and showed how it worked. Um, and then we broke the machine. Um, so I think it's a little bit more When you more say you about, broke the machine, can you talk more about that? So we, we, <laughs> we built a machine based off of song lyrics from a recording artist in Seattle called Dre's. Mm-hmm. And so um, the lyrics are like the city ain't the same and it's all like places in central Seattle that used to be black owned businesses that are now white gentrified, you know, chains um, and condos. And, um, you know, it was interesting because the school that I was working in at the time was in very far North Seattle. And this, this, uh, this music video is about central Seattle. And so the students in one school really don't think, I don't think they understood what like gentrification was and like why it was happening. So we built this whole map mm. machine, right? And tried to figure out like where are these things happening? And we like named schools across town so they could just get a better, bigger picture, but still a smaller picture, I guess. But And maybe we should, we should say that, so building a machine is a pretty basic theater tech technique, yeah. me- meaning that like you make a machine with your body. So you right. each individual, or we have students working in pairs, you can do however you do it. You create a repetitive sound or word or phrase and a repetitive gesture, and that is your piece of the machine. Mm-hmm. And then you put, you put the participants together, to, you, know, you connect them in various ways 
So it is, in this case, it's an abstract machine. It's a representational machine. It's not, you know, mm -hmm. a machine that like mm -hmm. builds something specific. You can do that too, right, but right. that's not what this yeah. was. So we had, so we showed this video, the Dre's video. We gave the students some other resources to read, just learning some stuff about gentrification, about red lighting, like gave them some, some tools, some information. Uh, they came up each with something that spoke to them about gentrification. So they came up with a word or a phrase. It could be something that they literally heard or read, or it could be just words that came to mind. They came up with some kind of gesture to support those words. Um, we, we created the machine and the original idea with the machine was just, we're just gonna put it together. Like we're just gonna have people do what they're doing and then we're gonna find ways to make connections. And then Jennifer had this idea of let's lay it on Seattle. So we imagine like if we're looking down on the floor of the room, this is the map of Seattle we labeled what's where. So like here's north, here's south. And she oriented us correctly in the room. So like real north was where the north of the city was. And then the students put themselves where they belonged, where their piece mm -hmm. of the machine belonged. Yeah, but so, so back to the, the lyrics, I think yeah, we yeah. can kind of yeah. model a little. So like in the song, the line that spoke to me was, it says, I don't see uh, white sheets, but these suits and ties look the same, same to me. me. And I was like, hmm, that's, that's a pretty powerful image. Right. So we came up with the, uh, like, 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 so like you're kind of getting a movement and a repetition, so you're like you're really thinking about it. But like if you want to say more about how do we get from there to breaking the machine. Right. So then we looked at the idea of transformation and we we wound up ultimately creating a three-part machine where the, the first this so this was the first part, the machine of gentrification. And then we actually went to part three, which was what do we want it to look like instead? And we had the students transform their those original words and gestures into what do they want it to be and then we created a middle piece which was how do you get from where it is now to where you want it to be and so what we ultimately wound up with was a, a, a sequence uh, of three sets of words and phrases and gestures that we could repeat so we could do a full round and like we set an order so that mm -hmm. and we and yeah. we and we did all of this with the students like well what comes first where does this begin right and Whose what is, action is leading to those next right. actions How and what gets running and what gets triggered so like you know so we set an order so say we had you know 20 words and gestures um so that went cycled all the way through and then when it then it went back to the beginning and then the second round was like how do we change it went all the way through and then the third round was what does it look like in the end all the way through and somebody did a thing did a trump thing in one of those machines i was it's just thinking true. about your mm -hmm. your yeah. question about that um i, I, I can't what remember was. what they said but yeah. it's a bit, some people went out yeah right? they're mm -hmm. like okay this is bigger this isn't yeah. just a seattle issue and this some is people like a, stayed yeah stayed in but it was, it was it's really cool because, and then the, the transition piece is if, if we know what the problem is, if we're working in problem posing education, we identify gentrification as a problem. If we're 16, maybe we don't know how to fix that problem, right. um, but we, we can imagine what, what the opposite would look like. Right. And then, then the, I guess the, the potential like research space is so rich then mm -hmm. with like okay well how do we how do we get from here to here and right. then again like I was saying before like where are other people experiencing this problem and what can we learn from there too that mm -hmm. you can build this whole body of research mm -hmm. and connect to solve problems together right and that that middle piece of how do you change it then wound up connecting to real projects mm -hmm. that your students mm -hmm. chose to do yep. at the end of the school year. So, so that it wasn't just like, you could so often I think you can do this kind of thing in the classroom and it just, it's like magic, right? So like, here's gentrification. We can all agree that gentrification is bad. And then here's what we wish it to be instead. And you know, it's everybody living in harmony and it's some <laughs> oh, like, well, right, you know, right. magical yeah. thing that we don't really think about all the steps. Like yeah. it's not gonna just happen. Um, so that was really an amazing thing that happened in your classroom yeah. is how those students got a fire lit under them yeah. to take some action. And so just some of the projects yeah. that came out of that that were, were pretty inspiring is we named homelessness as a piece of the gentrification 
um, problem and kind of noticing it specifically in the Lake City area. And there is a food bank, um, but students were like, it's gonna be summer, because this was back in the spring. And they came up with the idea of having like summer kits. Mm -hmm. So then they were like, and, and they wanted it to be like environmentally friendly too. <laughs> like, so, so they were trying to um, raise money to put together summer kits with like visors mm -hmm. or hats and water, like sustainable water bottles and, and things like that. So they were starting to engage in that way of like, what if we just hand these things out? Because that's right. like, you know. Um, and another one was a, a student who was very concerned about some of the things going on at our at the southern border. Um, she wanted to, to to raise money to like you know help somebody for something, and she uh, got connected with a group um, in Seattle who were providing legal services to undocumented um, people. And so what she used the school had a laser cutter like for wood, and she cut all these little earrings out. Hmm. And she made like five hundred dollars. Oh, wow. um, you know, self. And she even like hashtagged it out about like who it was for, and like just on her own, and went in them to, and just, like cut all these things, hand painted them, and then gave that money to this legal services. So like, it just really those those things like having an idea, helping this young people find the right resource and the cause. Wasn't, am I mixing them up? Wasn't that a student who, in particular, you were worried about oh, when yeah, I first came in? Yes. You were like, she, she didn't want to. I was kind of like, yeah. she does. She's not going to do this. Yeah. She doesn't want to do school yeah. at all. Doesn't want to be here. Right. She I don't like, did she, everything. She true. did everything. Like she it's was true. one of my best students, which is kind of theory. It was almost always the case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was, yeah. She was pretty inspiring. Yeah. Do so. you see impact uh, outside of the classroom you were in, and maybe with administration? Um, well, I know that yeah. someone at that school has requested somebody to come back and oh, do more, so really? you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I, we're going to talk about how to roll it out in a yeah. different school, a completely different environment, and see, how, see what we can do there. Um, and yeah, I hope that it's, it's growing everywhere. Speaking of growing, before we started, you mentioned something about your curriculum being whitewashed. Yeah, so I think yeah. that there's the danger here. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm always trying to be mindful in ways in which I might be slipping back into um, institutional practices because I am part of the system, right? And it's sort of being mindful about that while knowing, again, that power structures will resist any any pressure on them it's just like any any force will mm -hmm. <laughs> equal an opposite force um and so there's been some um issues with trying to do this work with fidelity and having people try to make it look more palatable right mm -hmm. um to say like oh well i i mean i don't it's just a little bit of that comes with the territory like there there's um um I guess what you're asking me about yeah. is what I named before. Uh, yeah. Some of us have come up with this idea of rewriting education mm -hmm. as more educators of color get in the work, speak up, and don't fear retaliation. Um, then it, that work gets kind of co-opted because it's like, oh, this student's mm -hmm. like it, it's got energy. But let's make sure we put it inside these borders of acceptable a curriculum and acceptable um, outcomes. and. I, I don't know, then it's like back to like, well, what are we doing in education if we're just trying to systematize people? Um, so yeah, there's some, some co-opting by um, administrators to try to take control of the work. Like you can't control this work. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you, if you look at the origins of industrialized education mm -hmm. by Horace Mann, school was made to right. create employees for factories and also more importantly to create docile human beings mm -hmm. that know, knew the rules mm -hmm. and systems in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you're talking about uh, systematizing and putting things in boxes, what, what, what can we do, what can people do listening and watching to break those structures? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we talk to our administrators, our principals, our superintendents uh, to not, not basically break the machine that you built mm -hmm. right in class? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think really the most success I felt with 
doing this work, and we're not done because we're going right. to keep doing yeah. this work, um, is really watching those students on that stage with the microphone. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who, I mean, they, because uh, we worked through indigeneity and um, students were, were giving land acknowledgements, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're it's, if we grow this work with the, the youth, right, then they'll just hopefully be the generation of people who like take, take it, it forward with right. them, right? Um, yeah, I, it's a, it's a, it's a hard question, yeah. <laughs> but. And it's something that we try to keep embedding sort of reflection points in our own mm -hmm. practice together to make sure that we're in, you know, we're, we're in right relationship mm -hmm. with each other, ourselves, and the students that we're working with. So just going back to mm -hmm. as much as possible, if we can put the microphone in the hands of the students and let them speak their truths. I, I just feel strongly about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot to say, but yeah. man, look, like yeah. it's the, the, the proudest moment is just really watching them take ownership of it. And I think, I mean, as a parent, that's what I want, right. you know, with my child and all of my, my public school children too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so would you say that is your evaluative measurement? Like how you evaluate success in the school? Because one of the questions was how do you evaluate mm -hmm. what's happening mm -hmm. to keep the funding going, to keep it moving? Mm -hmm. So what evaluative measures do you have in place? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Um, well, like, I'm going like to defer to yeah. other people because to me yeah. it's the empowerment of the youth. But. Yeah. yeah, we, because this is coming from special funding um, from a grant and we're trying to pilot uh, different modalities, different ways of doing this work, the kind of evaluation we're doing is like student-centered, classroom-based, mm -hmm. you know, assessments in real time based on like, where did you start, where are you ending up? Let's like help tell stories about this um, from the student's perspective and teaching artists and teacher perspectives. Um, so it doesn't, it's not, you know, we're not evaluating it in a way that maybe some schools would, right. um, but it contributes to, to the grade mm -hmm. they get in your class, in your mm -hmm. social studies class. And there's easy ways to overlap, like, oh yeah, these are the goals and requirements of my social studies class. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? True. And we're adding this other layer, which is what integration does anyway. We're, we're like, you know, we're adding this theater layer and they're doing these theater skills as well. Um, so I would just say we're like adding a level of like complexity to the conversation around what we're looking for and what success looks like in a collectivized classroom that is a little less hierarchical where everybody's accountable mm -hmm. for themselves and each other um yeah and they still get a social studies grade mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's tricky in the same way that you know all of us who work in the arts have faced for years right yeah. like, how do you assess the arts like it's not about talent it's yeah. not about you know is that a pretty picture is that a is that a you know beautiful dance mm -hmm. it's about yeah that it's about skills, that it's about engagement, and that it's so, it's so much trickier to assess it in a way that fits with the machine of education. Yeah. I think Jennifer read someone's mind on that <laughs> resources. <laughs> she just shared, you can't see this. Yeah, <laughs> I can send it back. yeah we can send it, but it's waethnicstudies.com. Uh, resources that can well, be utilized. I'll, I'll yeah. say um, yeah. of the blog piece that I wrote after Rachel and I um, worked together in my classroom is there. So if mm -hmm. you like some questions maybe that you have, you can read that piece, as well as other pieces from other educators who I'm working with doing lots mm -hmm. of different projects. If you're if you're here for social justice, um, then there's some other articles there with some other resources too. Um, and then I would get a copy, go to the library, get a copy of Frary or the Boal book. Mm -hmm. and, and or both. Or both. Yeah. Um, and then Sometimes you have liberation, it's a little easier to read. It's nice dialogue. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> liberation is a good one. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe we should just plan to do some more. Maybe we need to do a part two where we are filming doing mm. yeah, some of the things. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, yeah, good. And this is applicable in, in oh. not just in Seattle or Washington State. Yeah. We, we can do this anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and anywhere. Yeah. And really, I mean, coming back to the question you asked before about like yeah. how do you get administrators, like how do you how do you sell it? I mean, you didn't really yeah. ask it this way, but how do you sell it? But I mean, because it's not just academic, right? Like the interview mm -hmm. press is ex is experiential. Like I think about you know, so we've now done a couple of. I mean, we we did 
professional development for the teachers who are involved in this program. Jennifer and I have done one, two, like we've got more, like we're, we're sort of developing this as a, as a professional development for teachers. And I feel like for administrators to experience that too, not so much to know what it's gonna happen, how it's gonna be in the classroom, but I think when people experience it mm -hmm. and make those personal connections, I mean, you know, maybe it's a pie in the sky hope, but like right. my hope is that then administrators who are human beings mm -hmm. can recognize the resonance of actually feeling connected to what you're learning and, mm -hmm. and yeah. And that maybe that's a way to start selling administrators on it is give, give them a chance to experience it as human beings and then see what it does in their schools and in their classrooms. Cool. We are running out of time. Okay. Um, but I have two questions and I'll roll it into one. Okay. First question is how can this be applied to uh, creative aging populations? So some of our elders, mm -hmm. you know, there's a popular meme, okay, boomer. Mm -hmm. How do we reach the, the elder generation, so to speak, or an intergenerational, mm -hmm. is that possible? Mm -hmm. And two, any final words for people watching and listening? Mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking about the warm up game that's uh, when I was younger. Right. When mm -hmm. I, was uh, I share common ground. No, no, no. no. The, the, like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, Tina's game. Where I come from, most of the people. Are no, no, no. no. When I was younger, um, people. Oh, people would say this. Yeah. 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 Right. Like, yeah. yeah. me. Yeah. Mine's always like, you know, Tina, get off the phone. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can, like, yeah. It takes yeah. you back to your your youth, whatever yeah. youth, whatever how long ago that was, sure. to, to recall a memory of something that people said to you and every time we've done this it's been like some people are like you know so and so you're you're so tall you know mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's like it's really something negative, negative. like yeah. do you recall these negative memories you know like oh and i do this i'm like jennifer why don't you speak spanish you know and then right. because because that's something I had to deal with as a next person growing up. It's like, why don't you speak Spanish? Uh, but it, it helps me say that without having to like say, hey, everyone. I don't speak Spanish. Don't, you know, <laughs> uh, don't ask me. <laughs> or before you do, I already told you. Yeah. So it, it just, I don't know. There's some really cool ways to come go back to when you were in school, because we did some um, different arrangements of like, okay, we're walking around and we're at the beach, right? Where are you? You know, laying out having a tan, other people are hiding under a tree, right? But like we're in school, where are you? You know, yeah. so many people head for the door. So like, what what is that? Like, let's go back to your own schooling and let's unpack what didn't work for you and be thinking about what's yeah. not working for you today. Yeah, I think all of the, all of the games apply. I mean, to anybody of any age. Yeah. So much of it is like is mining your personal experience right. mm -hmm. and then working collectively for right. some common goal. Right. Right. So it's like, oh, let's all be in this seen together which is about that yeah. You know, yeah yeah be great awesome well thank you everyone thank you rachel jennifer and tina lara who's on Ooh, on online the set and the national guild thanks ashley thanks james yes this was super fun thanks, everybody i hope we can do a part two yes yeah. part two <laughs> sign us up